Hello and welcome to yet another edition of World Panorama, where you get a complete roundup of all the biggest international news stories. I'm Ashwarya Kapoor with you. Let us start the program with the headlines. U.S. President Donald Trump declares national emergency to fund wall on U.S.-Mexico border without congressional approval. Democrats to challenge the action, call it a violation of the American Constitution. U.S. ramps up efforts to build international coalition to apply pressure on Iran. Presses on EU withdraw from Iran nuclear deal at the Warsaw summit. Uninvited Iran calls the gathering dead on arrival. Power struggle in Venezuela intensifies. Opposition leader Guaido says the will ensure humanitarian aid is brought into the country. Maduro says would block it. Claims it was a means for the US to intervene in Venezuela. And after a three-month-long drug trial in New York, El Chapo Guzman found guilty on all 10 criminal counts, faces life in prison to be sentenced on 25th of June. The big story from the United States where President Donald Trump has declared a national emergency in a bid to fund his promised wall at the U.S.-Mexico border without congressional approval. The move came after the Congress passed a bipartisan agreement uh, preventing the government from shutting down. But the bill gives uh, President Donald Trump only $1.3 billion for his border wall far less than the $5.7 billion requested. The president thus declared a national emergency to get more funding, an action that Democrats vowed to challenge as a violation of the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. House of Representatives on Thursday approved the border security bill by 300 to 128. It was earlier passed by the Senate. The bill aims to avert another government shutdown. The compromise legislation passed by Congress includes $1.3 billion in funding for border security. This came after Republicans and Democrats reached an agreement on Monday night to finance construction of a new barrier along the U.S.-Mexico border. However, Republicans agreed to far less money for President Donald Trump's border wall than the White House's $5.7 billion wish list, settling for a figure of nearly $1.3 billion. We have all finally found a compromise that Congress can pass and the President has indicated he will sign into law. This is not a loss for the President, but a win for the Department of Homeland Security and a significant step in the right direction for border security. Though a shutdown has been averted, President Trump is not backing on his planned border wall with Mexico. He declared a national emergency to fund the wall without congressional approval. The move will act to bypass Congress and use military funds for the wall. Building the wall was a key election promise by Trump. The president insists the U.S. needs a physical barrier on its southern border to stop the flow of migrants, which he says has reached crisis levels. I'm going to be signing a national emergency, and it's been signed many times before. It's been signed by other presidents. From 1977 or so, it gave the presidents the power. There's rarely been a problem. They sign it. Nobody cares. I guess they weren't very exciting. But nobody cares. They sign it for far less important things in some cases, in many cases. We're talking about an invasion of our country with drugs, with human traffickers, with all types of criminals and gangs. However, Democrats say that the move to declare national emergency is a gross abuse of power and a lawless act. The Democrats vow to challenge it as a violation of the U.S. Constitution. The officials from California and rights groups also say they were prepared to file a lawsuit against Donald Trump. As the president said himself, he didn't have to do this. There's no emergency here for the nation. He's just using this as his cover to try to 
move this further. Differences over border wall remain, but the compromise pact came in time to alleviate any threat of a second partial government shutdown this weekend. The recent shutdown that lasted 35 days, the longest in US history, left more than 8 lakh government workers without paychecks, forced the postponement of the State of the Union address and sent Trump's poll numbers tumbling. As support in his own party began to splinter, Trump surrendered, agreeing to the temporary reopening without getting money for the wall. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. A United States-led two-day conference on peace and security on the security challenges in the Middle East took place this week in Poland. The meeting was first announced uh, last month by U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo after his strongly worded anti-Iran speech in Cairo and has been widely perceived as an effort to rally world powers behind Washington's vision against Iran. Expectedly, the gathering was denounced by uninvited Iran as dead on arrival. Government officials from more than 60 countries meeting in Warsaw in Poland at a US-sponsored conference on the Middle East. The genesis of this gathering was a proposal by the Americans to have an international meeting to increase the pressure on Iran. But then the agenda was broadened with the meeting ultimately built as a ministerial aimed at promoting a future for peace and security in the Middle East. However, the U.S. was determined to use the summit to expand its anti-Iran coalition. We make no bones about it. We think uh, that we need more sanctions, more pressure on Iran. We think that gives the Iranian people the opportunity to get what it is they so richly deserve. We think that denies the Iranian uh, kleptocracy, the clerical leaders there, the wealth and resources they need to create so much destruction that we heard about from countries all across the world in these two days. European powers who opposed the Trump administration's decision to pull out of a nuclear deal with Iran were openly skeptical of a conference excluding Tehran. France and Germany declined to send their top diplomats, while British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt left before Thursday's main events. The conference comes at a sensitive moment as the European Union is trying to prop up JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear deal, which was signed to prevent Iran from building nuclear weapons in exchange for sanctions relief. The US withdrew from the deal after President Donald Trump's May 2018 decision. Iran described the Warsaw Conference as dead on arrival and another attempt by the US to pursue an unfounded obsession with Iran. Some of our leading European partners have not been nearly as cooperative. In fact, they've led the effort to create mechanisms to break up our sanctions. Another issue in spotlight was Israel-Palestine tension. A Palestinian delegation was reportedly invited to the conference but refused to attend. Israeli PM Netanyahu used the summit to warm up to Arab leaders. So far, Israel has formal diplomatic relations with only two Arab states, Egypt and Jordan. The summit witnessed Netanyahu meeting Oman foreign minister on the sidelines. Oman does not formally recognize Israel. Netanyahu hinted that other Arab countries represented that they were engaging with Israel. I have to tell you that the courageous decision of uh, Sultan Qaboos to invite me to Oman is changing the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's pointing the way for many others to do what you said, not to be stuck in the past but to seize the future. The conference also comes as the U.S. starts its policy of disengagement in the region. Trump announced in December last year the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria. Warsaw represents the first attempt by the Trump administration to build a coalition. Pompeo's call in his opening speech for a new era of cooperation in the Middle East was viewed with skepticism by EU leaders who felt they were not consulted on the planned withdrawal of 2,000 U.S. troops from Syria. Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV. 
And the United States has urged its citizens to reconsider their travel to Pakistan, mainly due to terrorism. The Federal Aviation Administration, in a notice issued on Wednesday, said that the terrorist groups continue plotting possible attacks in Pakistan, adding that terrorists may attack with little or no warning, targeting transportation hubs, markets, military installations, airports, tourist locations, places of worship and government facilities. Now, noting that terrorist attacks continue to happen across Pakistan, with most occurring in Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunwa, the State Department said that large-scale terrorist attacks have resulted in hundreds of casualties over the last several years. Urging its citizens not to travel to POK, the State Department said that militant groups are known to operate in this area. The biggest story from Venezuela now, where the opposition leader Juan Guaido has vowed at a rally in the capital Caracas that he will ensure that humanitarian aid blocked by President Nicolas Maduro is brought into the country. Now, Guaido said that new collection points and routes into the country would allow volunteers to bring the aid in on 23rd of February. However, Maduro says that he would not allow aid in, claiming that it was a means for the United States to intervene in Venezuela. Venezuelans are facing drastic food and medicine shortages amid an economic crisis. Food has become weaponized in Venezuela, so have syringes and medical kits. Food and medicine have become invaluable commodities in the battle over Venezuela's power battle. Opposition leader Juan Guaido says humanitarian aid will enter the country on February 23rd, further setting the stage for a showdown with the government of Nicolas Maduro. Guaido declared himself interim president of the country last month. He says on 23rd February, new collection points and routes into the country would allow volunteers to bring the aid in. Contamos con ustedes, hermano y hermana. Para el 23 de febrero, ir en caravana, en marcha, como tengamos que ir, a cada uno de los puntos. Allá se incorporó Curazao como centro de acopio. Y seguimos construyendo todos los espacios. U.S. humanitarian aid trucks arrived last week at the Colombian border city of Cúcuta, but were stopped at the bridge by Venezuelan troops. President Nicolas Maduro claims that the humanitarian crisis has been concocted by the media and political enemies. He argues the delivery of supplies is simply a step towards intervention by the United States and the nearly four dozen other countries backing Guado. Yo creo que Europa se ha plegado de manera acrítica a una política equivocada de Donald Trump. Y Donald Trump que ha pateado a la OTAN, que ha pateado a los gobiernos de Europa, que ha pateado a la Unión Europea, sencillamente les ha torcido el brazo y los ha obligado a una política que ha dañado a Venezuela. Donald Trump's administration became one of the first to back Guaido as interim leader. Venezuela broke off diplomatic relations in response, while Trump said the use of military force remained an option. The Trump administration has also imposed a raft of economic measures on the country, including sanctions against the state-owned oil company PDVSA, Venezuela's main source of revenue. However, Maduro has dug in his heels. At the United Nations, Venezuela's foreign minister said that a new coalition of nations would fight what he called an illicit American-led effort to topple his government. He was flanked by administrators of several countries that have joined the group, which includes China, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Russia and Syria. The U.S. has no moral, no authority in order to impose sanction to anyone. So it's in breach of this charter. So we're going to compel and to convince humanity and the world that no government in the world can take such decisions. Only the group of measures, if they were adopted by the UN organisms, by the Security Council, can be legal. The rest are unilateral actions that must be rejected by all the peoples of this world. Maduro, who has been in power since 2013, was re-elected to a second term last year. But the elections were controversial, with many opposition candidates barred from running or jailed and claims of vote rigging.
the head of the opposition controlled national assembly guado declared himself present on 23rd january saying the constitution allowed him to assume power temporarily when the president was deemed illegitimate however maduro continues to remain defiant bureau report rajya sabha tv Mexican drug kingpin Joaquin Al Chapo Guzman has been found guilty at his drug trafficking trial at a court in New York. Guzman was convicted on numerous counts including the distribution of cocaine and heroin, illegal firearms possession and money laundering. The Mexican was accused of being behind the all-powerful Sinaloa drug cartel which prosecutors say was the biggest supplier of drugs to the United States. The verdict could mean life in jail. Notorious cartel boss uh, Joaquim Guzman or Al Chapo found guilty of 10 counts of drug trafficking. The verdict came at the end of a 3-month trial in New York. The Mexican was accused of being behind the all-powerful Sinaloa drug cartel, which prosecutors say was the biggest supplier of drugs to the United States. The verdict means Al Chapo is likely to spend the rest of his life in prison. The 61-year-old showed no emotion as the verdict was read. As he was escorted from the courtroom, Guzman exchanged glances with his wife Emma Coronel, a 29-year-old former beauty queen, and giving her the thumbs up. U.S. attorney called the conviction a victory for the American people. The jury found that Guzman led the Sinaloa cartel, one of the largest and most dangerous drug cartels in the world. and that is responsible for violence including murders and the smuggling of massive amounts of narcotics into the United States over a period of decades. Guzman rose from poverty in rural Mexico to build a drug empire worth billions of dollars. The trial afforded a glimpse into the inner workings of the Sinaloa cartel named for the Mexican state where Guzman was born. US prosecutors said he trafficked tons of drugs into the United States over more than 2 decades through secret tunnels or hidden in tanker trucks, planes, trains, cars and even submarines, consolidating his power in Mexico through murders and wars with rival cartels. Witnesses testifying against Guzman included former cartel members and a cocaine supplier who underwent plastic surgery to disguise his appearances. Guzman's lawyers did not deny his crimes instead arguing their client was a fall guy for government witnesses they say they would appeal the verdict of course we're going to appeal i mean there was a, a, a tremendous amount of issues that were uh, were created here um we felt that um the cross examination of cooperators was greatly restricted overly restricted that's going to be an important grounds for appeal obviously the whole extradition process Uh, will be a ground During the high profile trial the jury made up of 8 women and 4 men heard testimonies from 56 witnesses a tale of prison breakouts gruesome killings and million dollar political payoffs Al Chapo first escaped from the Puente Grande prison in 2001 by hiding in a laundry cart He was recaptured in 2014 only to break free from the prison in 2015 using a sophisticated tunnel this time. Guzman was rearrested the next year and extradited to stand trial in the US in 2017. What led to his downfall was technology. Chapo ordered an encrypted communication network be made to be used among the members of his inner circle. But the IT specialist who built the network for him gave US authorities key access to the entire system. El Chapo is responsible for unthinkable amounts of death and destruction both in the United States and in his own country of Mexico. Guzman's deadly drugs destroyed many American families for nothing more than greed and power. Guzman is set to be sentenced on 25th of June. He is expected to receive life in prison without parole. Bureau report Rajya Sabha TV. 
The United States and China will resume a trade talks next week in Washington with time running short to ease their bruising trade war. Both the United States and China reported progress in five days of negotiations in Beijing this week. Donald Trump speaking at White House news conference said that the U.S. was closer than ever before to having a deal with China. He said that he would be honored to remove tariffs if an agreement can be reached. But... Uh, he added that the talks were very complicated. Meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping has said that a week of discussions has produced step-by-step -step progress. However, on Friday, U.S. President Donald Trump also repeated that he may extend a 1st of March deadline for a deal and keep tariffs on the Chinese goods from rising. And that is it in this edition of a World Panorama. But before we go, take a look at these visuals from Afghanistan, where people celebrated Valentine's Day in Kabul on Thursday. They were shopping for fresh red roses and gifts for their loved ones. Shops in the market were decked in red and white balloons, fresh flowers and also proclamations of love, sharply contrasting with Afghanistan's traditionalistic society, which largely views Valentine's Day as a Western concept and an opposition to the Islam religion. So take a look at this budding celebration. As I take your leave, I'll see you next week with another edition of World Panorama. Bye-bye.